was on the flight here yesterday, I was practicing because I recorded myself two days before. And I've recorded myself two times playing the same piece. And I just went over that thing with a fine tooth comb so that I don't have to spend time remaking mistakes when I sit down with bass. That is the voice of Susan Cahill from the Colorado Symphony and the Lamont School of Music at the University of Denver, one of many people that you're going to be hearing from today. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contra Race Conversations, and today's episode features a Q&A panel with several clinicians from the 2019 Chicago Bass Festival. And I've got to give a big shout out to Liz Clausen, who was moderating the panel. And by the way, it was a former student of mine. I'm so proud to be able to say that. Liz is awesome. And so thank you, Liz for actually miking up this event and making it so that we can put out this audio. We've done panels kind of like this in the past for this event. This event's over 10 years old, but Liz actually got some decent sound so we can put something out that's comprehensible. Now, the audience didn't quite get on the microphone for all of these questions, but Liz restates most of them, and I'm going to break in a couple times just to let you know what they said so that it makes sense. So in addition to Liz and myself, you will be hearing, and Susan, you'll be hearing from Tracy Rowell of the Oberlin Conservatory, James Vandermark from the Eastman School of Music, Sarah Nielsen from the Merritt School of Music, freelance bassist and super interesting person, Dan Lapodka, Dorian Jackman of DePaul University, and then, of course, Susan. Great panel. Honored to have them all in Chicago on a chilly day, but exuberant day and excited and the great audience and full of great questions. And before we get going, quick shout out to our sponsors, D'Addario Strings, Steve Swan, String Bass, Upton Bass, The Bass Violin Shop, and A440 Violin Shop, who was actually at the event and sponsoring the event. So I really hope you enjoy this panel discussion with the Chicago Bass Festival Clinicians. All right, welcome to our Q&A session. This is your chance to ask any questions related to bass or music that you might have for our clinicians. Uh, much like some of you here, many of you here, um, I was a bass player in the Chicagoland area. I grew up around here, and I, was, I went to the Chicago Bass Festival when I was in high school, and now I work in arts administration, and I still teach and play bass. And a lot of the people here do a very big variety of things with music. Um, so this is a great chance to ask any questions you might have about the bass or pursuing a career in music, anything that you might be thinking about related to bass or music. I think to start out, we'll just have everyone introduce themselves and maybe say a little bit about your careers and about how you started playing bass, um, a little bit about your journey. So we'll start over here with Jason. Hey, Jason Heath, and I've been involved with this event since the beginning, so it's very cool to see it grow and develop. And Liz here, who is one of my former private students, uh, emceeing this, it's very cool. So uh, I, I go around these days to various places and do events uh, like this and things for music education in general and do some performing, but I've done a lot of things. I, I, I used to play in the Elgin Symphony here in Metro Chicago. I used to teach high school orchestra and many other things and I got started in fourth grade and uh, starting violin and Sioux Falls South Dakota so that's a little bit about me hi I'm Tracy and I was bribed to play the double bass in the sixth grade when my mother who was a very fine violinist got us to uh, uh, rescue a beginning strings program and um, so she paid me five dollars a week to show up to class <laughs> And we later renegotiated 750 if I practiced, <laughs> and uh, that's how that's how I got started. So, and eventually, I think my parents bought me a bass and stopped paying me allowance for practicing, and and there you have it. But I have well, I I went to school at, at Rice. So I went to uh, Boston for grad school and freelanced in Boston for a while. And then I was the assistant principal base of the National Art Center Orchestra. Do you guys know where Ottawa, Ontario is? Okay, a few of you do. Okay. And then my husband, who was in the orchestra, got into the Cleveland Orchestra. And so life changed. And um, life happens. We moved to Cleveland and um, I started teaching. And I actually think that it's, it started off as something that, that I was doing just because there wasn't a whole lot of other things for me to do. But it turns out that, that I really feel like I found my life's work. 
Um, I teach at Oberlin Conservatory and at the Cleveland Institute of Music. Um, and I, my youngest student is currently, I have two four-year-olds uh, up through seniors in college at the moment. Hardly. Well, that, that's a fascinating story. Um, I'm James Vandermark. Um, my story begins in a similar way to Tracy's. My parents wanted to meet me to do something other than steal hubcaps in my small town of Owatonna, Minnesota. So they encouraged me to join the high school orchestra. Um, it turned out that I was fairly tall for an eighth grader, which is when I began. And the moment I began playing the bass, I never grew. So it stunted my growth in many ways. Um, but having said that, I uh, quit high school at an early age, became principal bass also of an orchestra in Canada, which I share um, with Tracy. I played previously as kind of the second bass uh, in the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra and spent a few years in Canada, returned to school in the U.S., and uh, was appointed uh, to the faculty at the Eastman School um, somewhere in the late Jurassic period. So I've been there for quite some time and uh, continue to play a variety of music. I love teaching. I have students um, at Eastman from bachelor's through DMA programs. And um, I also chair the academic honors program at the Eastman School of Music and do a variety of other things in music as well, and love all of it, particularly activities like this, where I get to see friends of mine that I haven't seen in a long time, and make new ones as well. So anyway, that's me. Hi, I'm Sarah. I came to Chicago about four years ago to study bass um, at DePaul. And now I pretty much um, teach full-time private lessons and um, also at the Merritt School of Music uh, in the West Loop. Um, I grew up in DC and I s got into music playing violin and then in my first year of college I realized that the bass was actually much cooler and decided to make the switch then and here I am. Hi, uh, my name is Dan Lopatka. Um, I'm uh, a, a freelance bassist uh, here in the city. I've been, I started playing bass when I was seven years old, uh, being taught by Virginia Dixon. If any of you know Virginia Dixon, she's amazing and wonderful. Um, uh, but uh, now, as a you know, as a freelance bass player, it's kind of like wearing a lot of different hats. Um, I don't really get to just do one thing. Um, but I, I primarily, uh, you know, I play with a lot of different bands um, and a lot of different styles. Um, I, uh, I work for a music software company. I work as a composer for a video game company. And, um, and I teach, of course, too. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's about it at the moment. My name is Dorian Jackman, and I'm the double bass professor at DePaul University. My musical journey, um, I started as a kindergarten violinist. Uh, that was a disaster. My mom was a music teacher. Um, so I switched to cello. I played that for about five years. And then in fifth grade, I wanted to play the saxophone, but that instrument rental cost was too expensive, and my parents liked to save money. So they said, you got to pick something else. So I picked the bass. So it seemed like a logical progression from cello. And so I stuck in music primarily for social reasons, because I liked the people in orchestra. They were really cool. And I think at some point, I don't think it was black and white, I just fell in love with it, and I stuck with it. Went to Illinois State for my undergrad, which is in this proud place. I have two close friends from my undergrad. And then I went to IU, uh, Indiana University, for my master's, and I'm finishing my doctorate. Anyway, I also wear a lot of hats I have to do my taxes, a lot of W-2s. I do a lot of playing in some regional orchestras. I sub in some uh, professional orchestras, and that's basically me. Hi, I'm Susan Cahill, and I uh, teach double bass at the University of Denver Lamont School of Music, and I've been in the Colorado Symphony for 20 years. Um, I grew up here in Chicago, in Evanston, actually and um, started studying bass with Harold Siegel, which maybe is a name that someone knows around here. But um, 
I started actually on piano when I was four, and I played piano all the way through college. Um, and I uh, got into the bass at around 10, and mostly because I wanted to play drums, and my mother said, no way. There's a lot, there's a lot of mother threads going on with all of this here. I do also do a lot of things in addition to the symphony and teaching. I uh, perform a lot of chamber music in the summers, travel around a good bit to do that, and I write music, and I play and write a little bit of jazz and tango, and um, it's, just a, it's just a really fun career, lots of diverse things that I get to do. So, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. Steve has been active in the bass world and also the guitar world for years. Here's a bit from our live podcast taping with Steve on how he got into that business. Guitars and basses. Guitars and basses. Okay, how did that happen? They're both helper instruments. I've always played the rhythm guitar quite often with bass lines moving, either in swing style, jazz style, or country style. Bass is the same thing, supporting the band, the group of people you're playing with. So I've always felt like I was a support person. I love how Steve describes being a support person, and he is certainly that for the bass community here on the West Coast, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. His shop is located just south of San Francisco, and he has a large retail showroom with about 70 basses on display. And these basses are professional top-of-the-line basses. These basses are student-level basses and everything in between. They're beautifully set up. So if you're looking for a bass or you know someone who is, be sure to check out Steve at steveswanstringbass.com. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast, Steve. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time high Highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restorations at affordable prices. Whether resetting your sound post, installing a new bridge, or giving your fingerboard one of their precision dressings, the Bass Violin Shop will work with you to improve your setup. They also specialize in resetting necks, repairing cracks, installing new fingerboards, and new bass bars. Whatever your playing needs, they will listen carefully to you and work hard to get the most out of your instrument without blowing your budget. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at BassViolinShop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. How is it that Upton Bass came to design a bass for Gary Carr? Well, it all started with an email. Here's Eric and Gary from Upton Bass on how this happened. Gary was at kind of the forefront of ergonomics in, yeah. in commissioning different bass makers to make ergonomic models to his playing style. And he, and he basically, he replied. He said, yeah, but, you know, here's what I'm looking for. I want something, you know, that's this, 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 and this. He sent the sketches. Oh, and, and by the and way, all. I want it affordable that any anyone going to my car camp could afford it. This model has become so popular, and Gary Carr even played it for the 50th anniversary International Society of Bassists convention. He was the opening he gave the keynote speech and he played two beautiful selections on his upton bass his car model upton bass learn more at uptonbass.com and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast now we're going to open it up for questions does anyone have a question that they want to start out with so i'm just going to break in here for a second and there's this very cute young man who got up and asked a question about something I believe Susan Cahill had brought up, which I can't remember if I left it in or took it out, but it was about, I blame my mother for all of this career, you know, kind of jokingly. And then the student stood up and said, can you explain what you mean by that? And so here's Susan actually then giving a very thoughtful answer. So we're going to hear from Susan. <laughs> you know, I blame my mother for the good things as well, because my mother um, loved classical music. And she was a pianist. And they had, and I kid you not, WFMT on the radio 24 hours a day. And I'll tell you a secret. When I was your age, she, her favorite thing to do was to clean the house to Dear Rose and Cavalier on Saturday mornings at full volume. And I hated opera for years after that. 
And it wasn't until I got probably into college that I realized, first of all, De Rose and Cavalier is like the best opera ever written. And second of all, there's this something about it when you're exposed to it at a young age, and it just gets into your bones. And it's better to have that get into your bones than some of the other things out there. So I do blame her. I do blame her for all good things and all bad things. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? OK, we have another question. Yeah. So the question is, where would you recommend going for jazz studies? Or maybe we can open it up to how would you further your jazz studies? Those are, I mean, both of those are, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack for both of those. How, how can you further them? And how can, and where should you go? Um, you know, a lot of it, y you always have to consider things like, uh, if you're going, don't go somewhere just because of a name. And I mean that as a university in general, like, you know, don't necessarily, you don't have to go to like Berkeley or something. Uh, and you can, but you, I'm just saying you don't have to. Uh, nor do you have to go there because uh, a certain bass player teaches there. Um, like if there's some famous player, because a lot of times if you actually look into those things, they're there like a week during a semester or something like that. So just just a thought, but. Um, yeah, uh, you know, go somewhere. You know, think about the, the things you have to consider about going to university. Is that you're you're building a network when you go. You're going there and you're meeting people and you're going. Those are probably a lot of the people who you're going to work with throughout your throughout your life, um, or at least for a time. Um, so you know, d you know, go check out the place, check who's, check who's going to be there, check, like, is it a large school? Like, for example, I went to UIC for my undergrad, and although uh, their music school has a lot of really wonderful teachers, and they, and they were always there, um, they, it was a very small school, so because of that, I got a lot of opportunities. So, like, if you go to Berkeley or something, hypothetically, they have, I think, around 1,000 guitar majors, something like that. And that's just their guitar school. You know, I, where I went, there were like two guitarists in the entire school. So those guys actually got to play gigs. Those guys actually got to get work. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, just, just consider, you know, do you want to go to a large school? Do you want to go to a smaller school? Do you want to go to somewhere where, you know, what kind of network are you going to have there? And then just uh, as a general question, how do you further your, yourself in jazz studies? You know, a lot of listening is really the key. A lot of listening and transcribing and, and doing that kind of a thing. And, and reach out to people who are, reach out to people you admire, reach out to people you, you know, who are a lot better than you and figuring out, you know, what are they doing that I'm not doing? And maybe if, if you can, take a lesson with those people. First of all, I'd agree with absolutely everything you said. Um, I might also add that particularly in the realm of jazz studies, and I'm not a jazz performer, but um, I've worked with a lot of young jazz performers and some older ones too who've come to study with me. It's also really worth finding out what the direction of the jazz program is at the schools that you would attend. Berkeley will probably have one thing, it's great, um, for some certainly, for many perhaps, um, University of North Texas has got its own take. Miami, the Frost School, has got another really amazing and different program than the ones that we've already spoken of. Oberlin will have something, Northwestern will have something. Um, there are lots of schools. Eastman has a, has a great jazz program. I would say the Eastman program is fairly conservative um, when compared to a place like Miami. Some people would want that. Others would not, but that's something that will play out, and it's kind of unique to jazz programs about what will go on. Doesn't mean you can't explore a completely different career if you go to X school and want to have Y career, because a lot of what will play so much into all of that is listening, finding your right colleagues at an early age, and being imaginative and open-minded. I guess one of the things that I would encourage people to do, and it's difficult sometimes to sense this as a senior in high school, particularly in a jazz program, is find an open, 
open-minded program and open-minded teachers who are dedicated to you. That will help you further so much of what your possibilities might be. I also am not a jazz performer, but I've seen a lot of young students and actually one of my former students, I can't take credit for his knowledge of jazz repertoire, but, but he was a late starter at the age of 18 on the upright bass and he ended up, he won the, a recent ISB jazz competition um, and he went to Eastman for his master's degree. His name is Mike Forfia. But my, my general advice to anyone who's a young bassist who's thinking about jazz is that you really want to learn how to play the instrument before you get to college. And that a lot of jazz young uh, college students that I've seen realize that too late or later than, than would be ideal that they need to master the skills of the bow arm as well. Um, that in this day and age that you want to have as much versatility as you possibly can. Um, and there's a lot of crossover, so uh, you want to uh, expand all of your skills as much as you possibly can so that you have options when you're a little older. I would also add to that that a lot of the traditional jazz greats um, took lessons with classically trained bassists. A lot of them took lessons when they were young with orchestral musicians. And so in the same vein, they really, they learned to master the bow while they were learning everything else. So it's a great idea to, to focus on all of those skills at the same time. I would add too, for me, when I was looking at schools, um, I really thought that what I needed was something like a conservatory, but I ended up going to a state school and um, I always knew I wanted to do something in addition to bass. Like at the time, I think I wanted to do photography or um, business. And I couldn't have done that, I think, at a lot of the conservatories I was looking at in a very easy way. And where I ended up was at the University of Wisconsin. And by going to a larger state school that was within a community, a smaller but very vibrant community, I was able to do a lot of gigging. And I was able to start doing arts administration. I was an orchestral librarian in college, and I helped to run a concert series. So I got all of these job skills that I really didn't know anything about arts administration until I was in college and I, I got to really learn on the fly and that was an amazing experience. So the greater university where you're at, every school will have some different kind of a feeling or a vibe and there will be different experiences that you'll be able to have there. And those are great things to check out as well when you're thinking about a school. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. I'm gonna break in here again and there are two questions that were asked that I believe did not get on the microphone. So they are, number one, do you enjoy practicing? And number two, what do you do to create fun and engaging practice sessions? There might be some people who disagree with this a little bit, but I'm just going to say it anyway. So I do a lot of gigging and I do a lot of really last minute stuff. So I have to get like ready really fast. And so I've found that actually playing orchestral music to recordings has been very helpful. Um, I don't use any particularly any particular recording as like a gold standard like oh this is how they're going to do it but it helps me learn it really fast and just playing at least even if it's fake like playing along with other musicians even though even though they're digital kind of makes it more interesting because um, like only working on like long tones for like four hours like yeah that does get a little bit old but i just find ways to just keep it fresh because like if you keep doing anything the same way you're going to get tired of it I have 11-year-old twins, so I always enjoy practicing. <laughs> always. And I, I wouldn't say that that was as much true before I had kids, actually. But to me, it's now, it really is a break. And, you know, I, I do a lot of very efficient practicing as well, because I have to. And I remember talking to a violinist friend of mine, and we were talking about the difference of how violinists, especially when they're in conservatory, can practice for like seven or eight hours. And I said, yeah, I mean, it'd be nice, but bass, it's pretty hard to do that, sustain. Maybe the week before, you know, something, or two weeks before something, you'd do it. And he, and he said something interesting to me. He said, you know, they're, they're mostly wasting time. They're not really getting a lot done in those seven or eight hours. So I'm always, I love to think about my practice in terms of how, how efficient can I be? How quickly can I solve a problem? When I was on the flight here yesterday, I was practicing because I recorded myself two days before. And I recorded myself two times playing the same piece. And I just went over that thing with a fine tooth comb so that I don't have to spend time remaking mistakes when I sit down with the bass. So. 
Um, so I was actually talking with Chris about this, so I'll be, I'll be brief, but I, I would like to make an app recommendation that has changed my life. And I do not love practicing. I, I mean, I, I don't, it's not the worst thing I could do with my time, but it's certainly not any of my top 20 favorite things. But I'm having a lot more fun with this app called, and they're not paying me to talk about this, but Modacity. Modacity.co. Oh my goodness. This thing, I, I, I started using about a year ago, and it's on my stand every single day. It's like a workout app but for practicing and it was designed by somebody named Mark Gelfo, a Northwestern graduate in cognitive science not music, then went to Indiana University for a master's in horn and one, uh, I think, principal horn of Hong Kong Philharmonic, or one of the spots in Hong Kong. Lives in San Francisco now, started this thing, and it's, 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 it's super, it teaches you how to practice smart. And I've been using it with my students, and I just can't, I, I could talk for 20 minutes about it, but check it out. It's really, really good. It's the only app I found like this for music, and it's just incredibly, incredibly useful. Hard to follow up on pushing it out. I, I apologize. Um, so in fact, I actually love practicing. Um, <clears throat> yes, there are other wonderful things in the world to do too. Um, I think what you've heard though is that the goal to enjoying your practice is basically recognizing that you revel in often just small accomplishments. But having said that, if your practicing is purposeful, efficient, then you'll probably get something done. There are a variety of ways of doing that. I think one of the great things um, a teacher can do for a student is direct them. Oh, sorry, it's not an app, but still, it's the idea, whether living or you know electronic. If a student can learn how to practice, accomplish something, and enjoy it, then they're on a really good path. It will change, it will evolve, I'm certain, you know, during a long career. But I think being able to enjoy your practice as much as, as much as possible and accomplish something efficiently, you're set. I think having music that you really love makes it a little bit easier. And if you're having a really hard time, you can do it in front of the TV. I didn't say that. <laughs> So I learned that from my husband. He's a bass player in the Cleveland Orchestra. So I didn't say that either, <laughs> but that, that's, that's, like a, that's like a coping mechanism. That's not something you want to do all the time. So. Can I have, add, a, add a quick twist in, into it? It's a real quick twist. So I'm often asked, um, I have a little different attitude for whatever it's worth, what music do you love the most? And my answer is usually what I'm playing right now. Because if I don't love it, I won't do it that well. Later, we'll talk about it. But <laughs> my comment kind of ties directly back into that: that um, it's fun to play music. So <laughs> it should be fun to practice. So if you're not having fun practicing, maybe you're practicing too much. Maybe you're frustrated. So then you have to find a way to cope with the frustration. And there's many ways to do that. And you, but you have to find that joy and just commit to it. And, and it does get easier as you find that, I don't know what, what the word is, but that thing that, that you love in it. I mean, practicing is a lifestyle. And I've learned in my own journey that everything I do is kind of focused around like, you know, bass, like, why do I eat well? Because then I can focus better when I play, or like, that'll help me practice, you know? Why do I want to exercise? Because that'll help me play, that'll make me feel better. You know, it's just, why do I want to get a lot of sleep? So I can play better. <laughs> I mean, everything that I do it has kind of a holistic, like, approach to bass. I mean, fortunately, that then, I guess, leads me to live a really good lifestyle, so I avoid other problems, like high blood pressure, or like, pick your problem. <laughs> So, but I, I feel like bass playing has made me a better person in a lot of ways. Like, it's really just made me live a good life. I would add to everything here that consistency is really important too when it comes to practice. Um, for me, if I'm frustrated or I'm kind of stuck while I'm practicing, um, I often focus on three small goals and I put on a timer. And then as soon as that timer is done, I know that I've put in work today. And putting in some work is better than 
stopping, getting frustrated and stopping. So that kind of helps me. The timer helps me to, to think like, OK, I'm going to focus on this one small shift for five minutes. And when that five minutes is over, I can put it away for the day. But if I do that every day, I'm going to make progress over time. I also journal. That helps me um, while I'm practicing. I will get back to you, but I think we had a question over here. So what do professors look for in a student during the college audition process? I look for someone who uh, is not afraid to show their musical personality and their individuality, and someone who um, shows curiosity in a lesson, asks lots of questions. Um, I, I would rather have someone come in and be self-motivated. I feel like I'm, I, I don't want to be saying, do this, do this. I want to help someone find their way and become in charge of themselves by the end of college because that's what you have to do, and so and so that's what I'm that's what I'm kind of looking for. And and uh, it's hard to know that sometimes just in an audition. I, I would recommend coming to visit and taking a lesson with a teacher that you're thinking about. It's even kind of hard to get an idea in one lesson what that's going to be like. So it's it's okay to start early and then maybe visit a, a summer camp and, uh, and come back later and check in with them again. So, so it's two ways. You're checking out the teachers, and then we're checking out you, too. So. <laughs> right. Well, truer words have not been spoken. Have a lesson with the potential teacher in advance. That makes all the difference in the world for both parties. Um, I would maybe add to that, generally, I would look for some appropriate mix of a current ability and potential. And that's sometimes a hard thing to read in 15 minutes. Again, assisted if I've met the student prior to that. But I think along with those things, what Tracy just suggested about attitude, a willingness to engage, um, an ability to listen, and that would be not only as a student necessarily, but the student being able to hear themselves. Because you'd be surprised at the number of fairly high level players, I think, who really don't listen to what they're doing, albeit perhaps incredibly fast and impressive, and impressive but they're really not aware of what they may be doing physically. That can be changed. Um, orally. All those things are in the balance. There are a lot of different factors. But attitude makes a really wonderful difference. And it's not just about being a submissive, subservient student. It's about having an engaging, musical, artistic personality. I would agree that taking a lesson is so important because Every teacher you meet is going to have a personality. You have a personality, and you have to make sure that it's going to be a good fit overall, rather than just saying, oh, wow, this person, their students win jobs or whatever. Like, that doesn't mean that you will win a job. You have to weigh, is it a good fit? I think with any audition, it's good to keep in mind that like there are people on the other side of the panel um, and at least when people audition at DePauw, I think, I think of it as both they're auditioning for us, but I'm also auditioning for them. Like, I want to teach a good lesson. I want to, I want to help them get better at bass. And so I, I really put myself under the gun and really make sure I, I do a good job. But really just having heard a lot of music, heard a lot of people play, like, I think potential, like, like they said, like it's very clear when somebody has potential, even if they're they could be making tons of mistakes, but those really, in my mind, don't matter so much. Like you can tell when somebody is really, like it's there. You just gotta, even if it's not a perfect performance, like it will get there. And so I think learning how to find the potential is, you know, that's the that's the task. Uh, well, a lot's been said that that's, I agree with. Um, I think maybe the only thing that, that hasn't been said is that what's going on in, in a, a professor's mind when they don't choose you. And a, a student will assume that it's because they failed somehow. But that's not necessarily the case. 
because we may know the other schools you're auditioning for, and we may know, oh my gosh, that person would be a perfect with this person. I know what this other person's skills are as a teacher. They need that person. And that does happen, especially in the base world. The base world is small, and, and all of us around this time of year, Tracy just finished, I just finished, you just finished, right? Everyone just finished auditions. And so we all kind of know now what's coming at us in terms of the field. And you know, we, we all want to fill our studios, of course, but we also know that you know, a person will succeed if they're with somebody else. So try not to take it too personally, because sometimes it's not just flat out, you know, you know they're, they're just not good enough for the school. Sometimes we know that other school, that's the, that's the place where they should be. And that my studio, I should make room for this other person who should be with me. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that actually happened to me when I was applying for master's programs. Um, one school I got into, but I got no scholarship money at all. I thought I played well. I was really confused, but then, the teachers must have talked because then I got into IU and I got a good scholarship. And so I, they, she's right, they must have talked because that's the only way that I can uh, rationalize any of it. <laughs> this episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Did you know that you can tell the difference between D'Addario strings by the silking? Peg and silking denotes pitch and tension. So E is green, A is black, D is yellow, and G is red. C, by the way, is purple if you have a C string. A thin band of yellow just before the metal winding denotes light tension, and a thin orange band of silking denotes heavy tension. Ball and silking, that's the stuff down by the tailpiece, denotes string family like Kaplan, Helicor, or Zyx. Learn more at orchestral.dedario.com, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Every violin shop has its own unique origin story, and here's A440's Michael Spadero on how the shop got started. My mother-in-law started this business in 1982, and she was a professional cellist. But uh, the story she told me was that Camille, my sister-in-law, is a uh, violinist with the L.A. Phil. Mm -hmm. And when she was maybe in high school, her violin was being repaired in a shop. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, the shop owner had some legal problem where, like, the Cook County Sheriff or someone confiscated all the stuff. Okay. So the only reason, the only way for my mother-in-law to get her daughter's violin back was to buy all the contents of the shop at a police auction. Okay. Wow. So, <laughs> since she had all these instruments, I think that's what initially made her start a shop. It's a great shop. I've gone there for years. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Michael. And folks, check them out at a440violinshop.com. Next question is I'm going to ask, oh my gosh, so many people now. Sorry, we're going to get some, make sure everyone has a chance to ask some questions. Yeah. Individual strategies for preparing for auditions or recitals. Okay, uh, it's something that I've heard a lot talking to people who have won auditions. If we just say is A list and B lists, or A list, B list, and C list. Um, let's say A list, B list, C list. A list. I need to work on that every day. That is, and things can move on the list. B list, pretty good, but it's my my old bass teacher from Northwestern University, Michael Vidani, and always referred to as like keeping all the plates spinning at the same time, right? C list, maybe touch it once a week. I remember Alex Hanna talking about that. And the A list, B list, and C list do change, but you want to kind of proportion your time accordingly. One more plug for Modacity. It's really easy to build those lists, Modacity. Okay. But. <laughs> I'm not getting paid. <laughs> Michael already knows what I think, so I'm going to pass this on. Okay. So, right, in addition to keeping the plate spinning, depending upon those things, is start early and make certain that your practice method and your awareness, um, two slightly different things regarding an audition, certainly, but same with recital or a big program, is that you're also building up your confidence. You want to play well, but you need to think well, because oftentimes people go into an audition and it, it feels like this. If you haven't done that, regardless of the size of the program, it gets problematic. You can't just expect that, you know, the good fairy is going to go boink at the moment you begin playing. It's going to be great. You have to prepare for that as well. 
So it's an important factor in doing it not to make one a complete neurotic in the practice room. But you have to imagine how it's going to be at some point in your practice so that if you have enough time, and you don't always have enough time, that's why the spinning plate thing is a great analogy. I would say that I have to set deadlines for myself that are closer than two months away, you know, or six weeks away, or whatever amount of time you have. So as someone who's not in school, I have to schedule a lesson or schedule a mock and reserve a room and go through all that work to make sure I'm accountable in between. So again, this helps me to stay motivated in keeping those, those plates spinning. And if I play a mock early on, maybe I'm not playing everything at tempo or whatever, but um, it's ensuring for myself that progress is being made during that time. Um, I don't often do uh, recitals or th or things of things like that, but I do play uh, gigs every weekend, and um, oftentimes with those, there's a lot of music that has to be learned, and oftentimes it has to be memorized. Um, and my biggest thing is listening, is listening, 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 and that's how I learn so much of it. It's just that if I can listen to it and I can sing along with it and I can internalize, that means I've internalized what I was trying, what I'm trying to do. And so um, that would be like, at least for me, that's my, my biggest thing is if I, if I just have to listen, 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 and internalize that as, as efficiently as I can. If I'm preparing for something like big and I do it right and I have a lot of time, like let's say a recital, I will set the program like you want numbers like, I don't know, year, year and a half before. So that like, I have, that's if I'm playing all fresh material. Um, and I want to have it built in so that I really have intense period where I'm working on it, and then I put it down so that when I then look at it again, it feels like fresh. Um, but there was a recital where I did it in a matter of months, and it felt like a complete disaster. So like doing like a recital, for instance, like well in advance, like a year or two before the actual date, for me, has been helpful. An audition, I don't know. You have to avoid excerpt burnout. So um, maybe like six weeks, two months before, and like keeping it fresh. I think that's the, that's the goal. Hey, how you doing? I'm well, thank you. Um, I guess the only thing some people haven't mentioned yet, and I'm sure everyone does this as well, but um, it often t doesn't come to the uh, tip of the tongue, is that I do a lot of that type of practice away from the base. Like I said, I was on the airplane. I had four hours to blow. I'm not going to blow four hours on an airplane without getting something done. That's just not my style. So um, I made sure I had stuff with me. And an airplane is actually a fabulous place to concentrate, because there really is nothing else to do. And you really don't want to focus on what's going on in the airplane. So um, uh, I do a lot of away from, from the base, uh, memorizing, practicing, visualization. Um, it, when I visualize, um, I, I, I try to be very careful that I don't visualize myself as I am currently playing something. I try and take it up a few levels to how I want it to sound eventually. And just dream, dream about how, how great it could sound and imagine myself doing it, and um, I find that to be incredibly powerful, and usually um, as powerful or not, if not more powerful than a, a neurotic practice session, fearfully based, you know, with the instrument, so. All right, we have to wrap up soon. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, yes. So what should you look for if you're a student looking for schools in that school? I had two very different educational upbringings. My undergrad, I had a very amazing base professor, Bill Kohler. Um, he was very useful time. He was there all the time, and he helped me with everything I needed. And I had a very kind of comforting uh, undergrad environment. And then when I went to IU, it was very different. It was like, it was more like I was learning more from my fellow students than the teachers, which was kind of like, it was a little different. and so. Yeah, I mean, you want to find a school where there's really good peers, but 
if you go to a school that maybe you think wasn't your first choice, it's not a deal breaker. So I, I got a lot of great experiences out of both. You know, a smaller college, I was able to gig a lot. I was able to get a lot of like jazz experience playing in big bands because you know they needed bass players. Um, and then at IU, it was more like a bunch of us. IU is a wonderful place. But there were like 40 bass majors, and that was cool because there were so many people doing bass, and I thought that was really cool. Awesome. I agree. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I kind of touched upon it earlier, but my, my biggest thing is just thinking about, you know, network and school size and, and essentially similar to what, you, what you're saying. Um, um, just because, you know, it, that's going to, you know, that's going to be what, I mean, I feel like music is one of the things where it's all about, or it's a lot about opportunities. I mean, I guess it's a little bit different if you, depending on what you're going into, but if you're going into like, like, you know, professional jazz player or freelance player or that kind of a thing, and perhaps an orchestral player too, um, you know, you're looking for as many opportunities as you can, or, you know, or maybe you want a lack thereof of opportunities and you just want to be able to focus on, on uh, playing. I know when I was in grad school, um, I had uh, uh, a lot of, I had an opportunity to, to teach some of the courses uh, that were there and like lead some of the, the combos and, and teach a jazz appreciation course and all that kind of stuff which I may have not had that opportunity uh, elsewhere. So it's just, you know, I, I, I look at it as a opportunities and school size and, and, uh, and, and just the, the, the social aspect of being there. What kind of, you know, people are you actually going to be working with and, and playing with and all of that? The most important thing, I think, is actually the vibe you get. Um, from the studio class and from your lessons and just from being in the school. If, the, if it's not somewhere you're going to be comfortable, you're going to have a miserable four years. <laughs> and like that's the, the truth of it. And you want to be somewhere that you can be happy because I think it's a lot easier to focus on learning and doing what you're supposed to be doing and getting what you want out of the school if you are happy. Um, yes to everything that you've heard before. I'd amplify in just a couple of things. I think it is very critical regarding the teacher that is chosen is that you find out if that teacher is primarily invested in you or if that teacher is primarily invested in themselves and that you're just going to be contributing to that. Think about it. It's a little bit more complex, but I think it's really important in terms of what the ultimate payoff would be for you as a student. Next point, think about what the other programs are at the school. If you're looking to be a great orchestral player, do they have a good orchestra? Is there enough playing? Is there enough emphasis on those sorts of things? If you want to become a great jazz player in whatever scheme of field of jazz you want to be in, Will there be enough opportunities for you to do that? And will you be supported along that way by your teachers, or are you just a number? Um, those things are, I think, a, a really critical thing. And again, the kind of character and the encouragement from the studio, um, your peers, is also really important. What's the vibe like among your fellow bassists at the school? So. Many people have just spoken about the teacher and the music school and the music program. And, and I would say, think bigger picture, too, because when one is 18, you may think that you know what you want to do. And you may discover that there might be something that you, something else that you want to do. You don't know about it yet. So I think it's, I think it's good to think about a little bit bigger picture. Uh, what else is at the school other than the music program? Um, is there something really interesting there um, that, that I might be able to discover? Um, the, the first time I really started thinking about this um, was one time when I was in grad school, I went into a, a lesson with Ed Barker, and I said, I am so burnt out. I really, I'm so sick of school. I just want to get out and get a job. And he looked at me. And this was my teacher was up on the pedestal in the Boston Symphony. And he said, 
I wish I could go back to school and take classes just for fun. And my jaw kind of went like this. And so I, I've thought about that many times, and now I understand more what he's saying. So I think it's important to think about what, what else, what other options there might be available to you on campus other than just, just base. Yeah, there's, there's a lot more to life and education than just base. And there, there, there aren't like a plethora of base jobs. Yeah, what? There aren't a plethora of base jobs just waiting for you to like insert your, you know, slot A into tab B. So uh, we generally end up doing something not exactly like what we expected at 18. So to echo everybody's point, it's a, it's a get a feel for the culture of the campus. For me, it was the city. I grew up in a small town. I thought it was super exciting to come to Chicago. I always tell my private students, you know, obviously get a lesson with the teacher early and, and go back. That's so important. But also find a way to connect with some freshmen that are there, some sophomores that are there. Bass is better. Anybody in music or in the school, but bass is even better. And kind of see, do you like them? Uh, do they seem happy? You know, I think those are all really important things. All right, well, thank you all, and thank you to our clinicians for taking some time to answer some questions. I think we are gonna get ready for our run-through of our music for the, uh, for the bass ensemble, but if we can give our clinicians a round of applause. That would be good. Thank you to everyone who was involved in this panel. Thanks to Liz for moderating, Tracy, James, Sarah, Dan, Dorian, and Susan. Much appreciated. And we've got links to their pages, their university faculty pages, and of course, I linked to Modacity, which I shamelessly bring up every, every chance I can because I love it. It's great. So I hope you enjoyed this. I do these kind of events throughout the year. Sometimes we get good audio, sometimes we don't, but I love to change it up and share it out. And I think they're interesting discussions and it's really cool to be able to open up to a much larger audience than was just at the event. Though it's a great event and if you are in the Midwest and you can make it out, it's going to be first part of 2020 next year and I'm planning on being there. I should be there. So I, I have a great time doing that and I have a great time doing this podcast and I do it because you're listening. So thank you for listening so much. And if you want to reach out, feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com will put you in touch with me. I'd love to hear about you, what you are up to based wise, music wise, otherwise what you might want to hear more of in terms of guests or topics or that kind of thing. That would be great. And while you're getting in touch, go ahead and hop on our email list. If you're not, we get all sorts of cool content sent to us that we share out via that list. We're talking free music, free technique uh, materials, uh, what's happening with the podcast, what's happening in the bass community at large. So I'd love to have you join us over there and also if you aren't in touch with us and our Contrabass Conversations community on Facebook, it's quite the vibrant group these days, daily conversations about all kinds of topics, and we'd love to have you involved there. ContrabassConversations.com slash community, or just go search for us on Facebook. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. And if you're looking for bass work or a beautiful new bass, Mitch makes great basses down in the Dallas area. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. And thank you to Krista Copper for going through and cataloging all the topics we talk about here. Super valuable. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>